Hi everyone, this is Mr. Neil Wright here, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. This is of a patient who attended with a blocked left ear and we have a large occluding plug of earwax and keratin. This is located near the entrance. We call that part of the ear canal the lateral part, so lateral means near the entrance. If, it, the cl if it's close to the eardrum or closer to the eardrum, we reference that as medial, so it's further away. Um, this plug is strongly attached to the base of the ear canal, so I'm just using a standard zolna suction probe just to wriggle this, trying to detach it from the floor of the ear canal. And I do eventually remove this in a large plug. And once we do, you will see uh, the patient has been using a lot of drops, and the drops has seeped through this plug of wax and collected in the ear. So behind this plug of wax is uh, almost a puddle of, um, I think they were using some olive oil, and that had also caused the skin at the base of the ear canal to become very wet and it needed to be removed. There was also a bit of drops that settled on the eardrum itself. And although we, when we removed this skin plug and keratin plug that you're seeing here, the patient did still remark that they still felt blocked. And that's because the eardrum itself was coated. Um, it had a l layer of oil that was sitting on it. So there's that plug. And when we re-enter, you can see all this wet skin, keratin. And you'll have a better view of it in the moment. Whilst you're watching this, uh, I'm just going to go through some of the Q&As from the last two videos. And as you can see at the bottom, that's that dead skin. It's a collection of oil. And I'm just going to mop it up using suction. We're going to use also a fine end gorge in a moment to remove this delicately off the eardrum and the ear canal wall. The priority here is to avoid uh, or to minimise contact with the canal wall because it can be uncomfortable. The patient's ear canal is quite bendy and twisty, so the second bend is quite prominent. So the endoscope is actually facing too straight into the ear. And you can see the, ear, the eardrum itself, it's, it's to the left, so we're going to have to accommodate for that bend. And you'll see that in a moment when we remove it, that that eardrum will come in focus, it'll be in the middle of the screen and we can delicately remove the oil, including off the anterior recess and inferior recess. Which So the inferior recess is a little basin at the bottom of the eardrum, and the anterior recess is a part of the eardrum that's hidden by the front part of the ear canal. And in the case of the left ear, it's the left-hand side of the ear canal. So just to the left there, there's a little trench, and that's known as the anterior recess. So let's go through some of the questions. So... I'm firstly going to answer some questions from video 901. Um, someone just made a comment. You can see that I'm working more with forceps. Yeah, I think that's a correct observation. I think in the last year or so, I'm definitely using the forceps a lot more in my procedures at the right time, of course. Another question is, have you ever treated family members? Yes, I treat quite a few, actually. Um, I think video 899 was actually of a friend. Uh, someone asks whether Otomize can be used during pregnancy. So I'm not a medic, so I don't want to uh, give it all pharmacists. I don't want to give the wrong advice there, but I did do a quick Google search and it's advised against actually using Otomize during pregnancy. But always just confirm that with uh, GP or pharmacist. Let's just see which other questions. Someone asked why I started to number the videos on YouTube. It's, so when I first started uploading videos on YouTube, I didn't think there were going to be that many or there'd be that much interest in them. But um, of course, the, the numbers grew and there were so many videos that someone actually suggested it that I number the videos. So it just keeps them all in order and people can always refer back to certain videos in the future. So I hope that answers that. So you can just see there, the eardrum's fully visible. We're just gonna try to mop up as much of this dead skin off the canal wall. All this, all, I think this dead skin's probably wilted because of all the drops, they had been using drops for a couple of weeks. So I'm just gonna go through. Uh, another question is why do you not start cleaning from the outer edge to the inside? So I believe on that video I did. Um, sometimes I like just going through to the center, the core of the wax. Um, because even if we're unable to remove the whole wax during the procedure, as long as I can alleviate the patient's symptoms and allow some air to enter through the wax or through the skin to the eardrum, the patient's symptoms are at least alleviated. 
and in some cases which are going to be really complex so I just try and make a little hole through the middle of the wax if possible and so at least the symptoms are alleviated but most typically I do think I um, remove the wax off the canal wall um, to detach it around the edge. Some parts of the ear, due to the anatomy, it's difficult to gain access some parts, so it may be that we peel off the wax or skin off some parts of the ear canal around the edge, but the remaining bit is a bit more complex. Um, there's a, a few people who are being a bit, I don't know, um, I don't want to comment too much on it, but I made a reference to, uh, I think in my second uh, but last video about I've had quite a few requests of people um, asking about my personal life and then asking me to crack jokes during the videos and become a bit more of a comedian and I did um, ref I did reply back to that and I thought I was pretty um, diplomatic I even said I don't want to cause offence but I was trying to explain that I'm getting a lot of these requests now and I'm not a this is not meant to be a, a comedy show I'm not a natural comedian um, I, I was kind of although they were being uh, light-hearted about it but in terms of Scrooge against me and lighten up and I think all I really did was just to explain that this I'm, I'm an audiologist and this is a um, an earwax removal channel and I, I don't want to I'm just going to be myself in there and it's uh, it's not just that individuals that individual and I did say don't take offense I don't mean it to be in a bad way, but I needed to explain it so because we're getting asked more and more about this. Um, and there's a few people there who have got a little thread of their own who's called me a few names. Um, I'll let them be if that makes them feel a bit better. But I thought I was being very diplomatic and by the response from everyone else on that particular video, um, it seems like I was very diplomatic. And so, but anyway, if that makes them feel better, uh, that's fine. It's not a problem. Um, so let's go through some of the other questions. What uh, bit of a, what would you what would you say for cleaning your ears? Yeah, so someone asked whether it's possible that I can clean my own ear. It's not really. Um, it's really difficult to do that. I'd have to probably use a mirror and use a reflection and trying to get in my ear. Um, my colleague, Mr. Rajali, is an ENT um, surgeon. I don't have waxy ears, but if I do have waxy ears, I would request him and him only to remove my ears. I've um, got complete faith in him. Um, Going back to Mr. Rajali, a few of you have asked for his YouTube channel. I did actually put a link up uh, in the second but last video, maybe in the last one, but I'll put it up again on the description on this video. So do have a look. Um, I'm just going through some of the more questions from 901. Do you, do, do you tell... Do you tell they have relief? Um, I think the, the question was... Is, do they do patients receive um, uh, immediate relief and can they hear straight away after wax removal typically yes that is the case um, again just reading loads of nice comments about um, about the comment I made about me not disclosing about my um, private life and trying to not make this into a comedy channel um, so thank you for all that uh, do the patients feel the skin being peeled? Yeah, sometimes um, typically it is well tolerated, but as you know, if you've got a bit of dead skin around your fingers or thumbs and you peel that away, it can be slightly uncomfortable, but most people um, tolerate it really, really well indeed. So, but they can feel it. I'm just having a look at some of the other questions um, a lot of them were relating to uh, Mr. Ajali as well it's a lot of lovely comments about how my videos have helped people change their habits about their ear about their ears and um, made themselves to go to their own doctors or audiologists um, and were able to diagnose certain ear conditions like otosclerosis for example through my videos someone asked whether I've removed a grade four keratosis of trans I haven't. Grade 4 is the most serious type and it's where the ear canals widen so much that it's, um, it's, it's eroded and widened so much. It's uh, the temporal bone, that's the bone that uh, encases the ear canal. It's completely uh, eroded and expanded the temporal bone and then into the mastoid cavity, so the mastoid bone. So the mastoid bone is a bit further back. So if you get your finger and feel the bone behind your pinna, which is the satellite dish on the outside part of your ear, you'll feel a flat piece of bone, and that's the mastoid bone. So keratosis obturans, grade four, is when the skin plug 
um, expands so much, it compresses through the temporal bone into the mastoid cavity. Typically, that's they would have seen ENT or been in hospital by that stage because it'd be really, really uncomfortable. And just again, just having a look through. Uh, what was done before endoscopy? Uh, I'm I'm guessing that means relating to earwax removal. So, um, historically, earwax was removed through in the UK at least with water. So first of all, so first of all, syringing, uh, which is banned in the UK. I think syringing that's an old metal syringe. I think that's still um, being performed in the US. The reason I say that I attended the American Academy of Audiology conference, uh, I think 2015, 16, and at the ex exhibition stall, they were still being there for sale. Uh, in the UK, the substitute for irrig syringing is irrigation. It's like a water pump, but they use the dent. In fact, that originated. So uh, a, a dental nurse who was using this irrigation machine for rinsing people's mouths, um, thought, oh, this would be a good tool for cleaning uh, people's ears. And that's how the concept of ear irrigation started, through, um, um, dental, through a dental hygienist. Um, then, um, obviously, under uh, supervision, it's always been an ENT microscope. Um, they're very good, very magnified, but the way a ton, they're not portable and they're very expensive. So audiologists in the UK then started using head loops, which is what dentists also use to look inside uh, people's mouths. But they're not very good, well, most of them are not very good at seeing things deep in the ear. The view is very narrow and limited. So then that's where um, it started to develop the eye clear scope back in 2015. So, um, and they've also got the where, where eardrums just perforate frequently. I'm not sure about the other part of that question, but hopefully I've answered the first part of that question. Another question was, does a client typically feel or experience as you remove debris like this? I think that, I think I answered that, uh, maybe they didn't hear my answer, as it's the same person, you see. Yes, um, I think I did reply to that particular question, uh, the video before, the before that, but people do feel, um, any, any type of debris, if you've got wax, dead skin, anything in the ear, when you remove it, the patient can feel that. Uh, very well tolerated, 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, so it's not uncomfortable for the patient. But yeah, you get you, your ears have got nerves in there, so you do feel the extraction. Um, someone asked whether I can post um, some uh, images of the instrumentation, so the ENT micro instruments that I use. I will try and do that this week. Um, I'll put it up against a little a ruler, so it gives you some perspective, but I'll try and get this out a bit later this week. Uh, this is the comment I read, uh, Mr. Robin Mead. Uh, I started watching your videos because I have an issue with my left ear. I wanted a professional opinion because of you. I was diagnosed with otosclerosis. I didn't want advice from a comedian or a bachelor wannabe. Um, so yeah, uh, th th that's why I started this channel, uh, exactly for those things, to give, to educate people um, uh, for that reason. So my channel is not a, it's not a, a personal channel. Um, it's a, it's a clinical channel. So, uh, and I'm glad that I was able to help you, uh, Mr. Robin Mead. Uh, I suspect it's Mr. Robin. I think that's a male name, but apologies if it's not. Um, I love this kind of ear cleaning. Thank you for the video. Thank you for the, the link to your friend's channel. You're welcome. Um, just going through, so it's just more videos saying, uh, just kind of backing myself up uh, with regards to uh, the purpose of the channel. So thank you for all those. What type of schooling and training did you require to be an audiologist? So I um, underwent a Bachelor of Science degree. Uh, it's a four year degree um, at Aston University in the UK. Um, so I hope that answers that. Uh, I mentioned um, in my previous video about I've, I've had a few stalkers and again people are just mentioning that on the comments on video 901. Yeah, um, so I had to, it was, it was quite difficult because uh, I've had to actually come off to my um, Facebook um, personal account if I'm honest because to get a lot of people adding me on my personal account and then, then also adding my friends and family. Uh, I'll get loads of messages um, so it was just a bit too much, um, if, if truth be told, and it, it's, my, my friends and family weren't happy because they were getting added by people, and then people contact you as if they're your friends via email asking for advice or free appointments, and then you just have to draw that line, so, um, 
So um, yeah, that that's Dorka's no longer uh, uh, in the mix, so that's fine. Um, let's just have a look at some other other questions. It's funny, one of those people that are making a few nasty comments about me were then making a nice comment, so it's a bit unusual, but that's life. Um, again, a lot of the... Yeah, thank you so much for all the nice comments. It was just... Um, I said I don't want to drag on too much about it, but it's just in support about uh, my position, about uh, the purpose of this channel... Um, I th yeah, and I think that's all the comments in that one. So now I'm going to go to video 902. I did say this is going to be a bit more of an extended uh, video today because I, I didn't get time to address any of the questions from video 901 on yesterday's video. So let's scroll down now. I'm actually at the clinic today and I'm looking at uh, the desktop at all the comments. Usually I'm doing these at home now on my mobile phone. But it's a bit more tricky reading the comments on my phones. I'm having to switch between uh, the software I use to edit the videos and obviously then on YouTube looking at the comments. Someone wrote delicious. Um, I hope they're referring to the wax. Does it smell? Sometimes earwax can smell or infection. The earwax can become quite acidic uh, and the acidity it gives kind of a rancid smell. So if the wax has been in the ear for a long, long time, yes, you can smell that. Uh, again, I'm just going through. Uh, in my last video, I mentioned about increasing the brightness to the max on your, if you're watching it on your phone, for example, just for a better, uh, better view, because that's what I use, that's what I do on my iPod. I make sure the display brightness on maximum, and that uh, gives the best imagery. So a few people have said they have done that, and they, are, uh, they can notice the difference. I'm just having a look. Uh, any chance you can show us the tank shot? That's from D, D. Yes, I will try and do that uh, alongside the instruments. So I'll try and leave that to this week. I will try and take some photos. Just wondering whether the way you do your procedures as the wax angel, as I call you, is done worldwide or in the UK. Um, so the iClearscape, the device that we developed at ClearWax, that's typically just available in the UK. I know a few people in Canada who have purchased it, uh, but they haven't undergone the necessary training, if truth be told. Um, and I did advise that they need training. Um, just COVID has, the pandemic has held everything back a bit. Um, I can't say too much, there's a lot going on, but I am hoping in the not too distant future that the iClearscope uh, will be um, worldwide. So watch your space. Someone wanted to know whether it's advisable if they get their ears checked from time to time or only when something is going wrong. I think in the UK there's a big push now to for people to get their ears checked on a regular basis, just like they would do with their teeth or their eyes. Um, I would say every couple of years uh, and when you're probably above the age of 50 or 55, perhaps every year, just get your ears examined and a hearing test done. Uh, it's not going to do any harm and it's, it's just good uh, just to make sure everything's okay. Can you start showing the plugs of the wax as you take them out? Um, yeah, so, so I, I think I understand that question. Um, it's, I think they're relating to when I remove the wax from the actual ear, if I can visualise it a bit more with the endoscope. Um, it's just so difficult sometimes when you're in a procedure, you're, you're not thinking about, well, I'm not anyway, I'm not thinking about the video afterwards. Um, so I'm just trying to complete the procedure. But if I can remember, I'll try and obviously just shine the endoscope on the wax plug as I remove it. Um, I hope that helps. Um, not about, it's another question from M and K. Um, they were uh, asking whether my eyes get tired every day with the procedures. Do I have any special routine with my eyes? No, um, I think my eyes are, I, 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 do, I, do, I have got glasses, well, I wear contacts, but um, I'm short-sighted, which means I think, um, any opticians can correct me, that I've struggled to see things further away. Uh, but I can see things in short size. Sometimes I can I can do the procedure without even wearing contacts because I've got my iPod right in front of me. Um, someone then asked whether it's my arms that get achy. 
I, I've actually, I think when we trained Clearwax delegates on the day, they initially, because you're using your non-dominant hand to hold the endoscope, which is something alien to everyone, because you're normally using, for you, with an otoscope, which we norm, what we audiologists normally use to examine people's ears, you use your dominant hand typically. With the, the endoscope, because you're going to be holding the instrument in your dominant hand, which is the, obviously, in my case, the right hand, because I'm right-handed, I'm holding the endoscope in my left hand, which is a hand that I don't often use, but you, your, your body, um, you, you, the muscle memory develops very quickly in that hand, so I don't actually, even if I'm doing a long procedure, find it tiring anymore, if I'm honest, but I know initially I probably did when I first started, and that's because all the clear wax delegates also men mentioned that, so I'm pretty sure... At first, it is the case until you build that muscle memory. Someone wanted to know whether olive oil can be harmful if trapped behind a plug. Um, olive oil, can it be harmful? Well, olive oil's um, slightly acidic, so it's the same pH as uh, the ear, so in that respect, no. But if it's trapped behind a wax plug, the wax plug can start absorbing the oil and expand and swell. I think they're waiting for uh, an appointment. Um, but And they're asking, whether they're just a bit worried about the oil may seep through the wax. So any type of drops that you use is probably going to um, seep through the wax eventually. Um, someone's made a good comment, one of the viewers, so they're obviously really taking on board some of the comments I make on the video. So sodium bicarbonate drops is best for keratin and olive oil for binding for wax. Brilliant, that's yes, exactly. I can't better that. Uh, so I hope you can get yourself sorted, this individual, I think they're in Canada. Um, if, you, if you use too much drops, it's just going to make symptoms worse. Um, so it's a difficult one to advise because you are waiting for ENT and there's no hearing there. So it's a tricky one. I do, I wish I could give you more advice, but um, just follow the drops, the, the, the instructions from the drops manufacturers. Um, and there comes a point where you can put too much drops in and it can just make the symptoms worse. Obviously, if the individual's got a perforation, you don't want to be using any drops whatsoever because the drops can seep through the wax, which it will do eventually into the middle ear and potentially cause an infection. How do you feel about using hydrogen peroxide drops is another question. I'm not a big fan. Um, I think hydrogen peroxide can change the consistency of the wax into a mashed potato consistency, which makes it much more difficult to remove. Um, hydrogen peroxide is also alkaline based where the ear is slightly acidic. Um, so some people can get a reaction to it. And hydrogen peroxide is a water-based drop. So again, water, I'm just not a big, I'm not keen on people getting water in their ears, as you know. Um, could this patient be suffering from keratosis obturans? So again, video 902, that's a, yeah, uh, uh, aspirin for a good point. The only thing that would say no, so, so having a skin plug in the ear doesn't always relate to keratosis obturans. A keratosis obturans is when the skin plug starts expanding and then causing pain. So one of the symptoms of keratosis obturans is a bit of discomfort. And this patient didn't have that discomfort. But it's, it's a fair, fair uh, observation because um, Aspen Paul makes reference to the ear canal. It does look a bit widened in that video 902, which, which it does. And primarily, they did have skin in that, in their ears. So it could have been a very, like almost like a pre-keratosis obturans stage in that particular video. Um, someone just asked for Mr. Rajali's um, YouTube channel. He's going to get a lot of subscribers, um, I suspect. <laughs> I will let him know. Um, he's not, um, so... Mr. Rajali doesn't upload regularly, he's obviously very busy, um, so just uh, bear that in mind, but he, I, he's just a brilliant surgeon, he really is, and he's actually a better person as well, uh, really nice chap and very knowledgeable, and he's at the top of his game, so I hope you can learn from his channel as well. Um, just trying to read through to the questions. Questions regarding swimmer's ear video. What is the most common type of ear infection, bacterial, fungal, or viral? It's a difficult one for me to answer again because I'm not a medic and we don't take swabs. And sometimes it's hard just to look inside the ears to tell which is a fungal or bacterial or um, viral infection. Sometimes uh, fungal infections are more apparent because you get fungal spores and you get these kind of 
kind of almost look like cotton wool fibres. Um, it's like a spider's web developing in the air. So that's very common. Bacterial typically, it's a bit more uh, a greeny colour. So if I was to answer that, and this is purely anecdotal, without that, as I said, I don't take ear swabs, so we can't be 100%, but I would say bacterial. Um, I'm just having a read through some of the other questions here. Someone asked whether, the, uh, someone's, should I, let me just repeat that. T.O. said that they saw a headline that said wax buildup can cause memory loss. Um, I think that headline possibly is more to do with, there was a, a big landmark study a couple of years ago looking into risk factors of cognitive um, disorders like uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. And I think there was a list of risk factors um, identified, I think seven key ones. And I think the, the, most, um, the most important or the most prevalent risk factor is untreated hearing loss. So what that basically means is, is that if you have a hearing loss and it's not treated, that is probably the biggest risk factor of developing cognitive deficiencies and disorders like Alzheimer's and dis- dementia. It doesn't mean that if you've got a hearing loss and you don't get hearing aids or you don't get it treated, that you're automatically going to develop that, but it's the biggest risk factor. And therefore, in the same light, if you've got a wax buildup in your ear and it's been there for a long, long time, unknowingly, or if you, if you just haven't had it removed, that will also reduce your hearing. It will also cause a hearing loss. And in turn, that can also then be a risk factor to developing um, dementia and Alzheimer's. So I hope that helps. I'd love to see the view from other instruments to the endoscope and how much better the endoscope is. Um, I did a, a conf, uh, uh, I did a, uh, a, a, I was a guest speaker at a conference last year and I'm doing it again actually in a couple of weeks. And in the presentation, I did side by side put a view of a microscope and an endoscope and I'll try and dig that out and put, uh, try to put it on one of the videos so you can see for yourself. Um, just leave that with me if I can. How big are the suction nozzles? So the standard zone of suction probe, it is internal diameter of two mil. Um, and the fine end gorge, I think it's 1.4 millimetres. So yeah, with the eye clear scope, as you've uh, a person, happy place, quite correctly identified. It looks a lot larger with the eye clear scope. Um, someone asked how my ear is doing, so uh, you may have known that I put some pictures up on my ear on my Facebook page. I suffer from eustachian tube dysfunction in my left ear, which led to glue ear. Um, it was very painful. I used the Otovet nasal balloon and uh, over-the-counter nasal decongestion spray. I can report that my ear is fine, uh, so thank you for asking. And again, that's not, I was just, uh, the reason for mentioning my ears, because obviously this is an ear channel, so I wanted just to explain, obviously I, I was fully aware of what patients are experiencing because I've experienced it myself. Um, just having a look at some of the other question. Um, Crystal Adams, a question, if I may, of course you can. Could long use of earphones cause dizziness? I'm going to say no, um, but... Loud sounds can sometimes cause dizziness, but I think your question was, could long use of earphones cause dizziness? Now, the reason why loud sounds can cause dizziness is this phenomenon called the Tulio phenomenon. And I'll just briefly explain that. Inside the inner ear, not only have you got the organ of hearing, you've also got your organ of balance. And the organ of balance um, is called the semicircular canals. There's three semicircular canals full of fluid. And, but it's encased by a bony part, uh, a bony membrane, and that protects the membranous fluid inner parts. On one of the, there's three semicircular canals, the top one, the superior one. Sometimes people can get erosion uh, at the top, so that bony part is no longer there, which then exposes the membranous part of the semicircular canal. And loud music can cause vibrations of the skull and this superior part of the canal that's the superior canal it's called superior canal dehiscence it's just underneath the skull um, uh, the meninges and with loud music it can cause so much vibration that the vibrations travel through the bone the skull and they can enter the organ of balance through the erosion of the bony part which normally protects it 
and we call that a third window syndrome and typically it's because the superior canal so this out of the three the one that curls upwards towards the brain it's that part of the bone is exposed so that can cause dizziness if it's loud music um, also coughing sneezing in those people can cause superior canal dehiscence and can cause dizziness I suspect if you have earphones for a long time, going back to that original question, it can create a complete acoustic seal and change the pressure in the ear. So pressure sometimes can cause dizziness, but I'm going to say no to the general trend of the questions, but hopefully the explanation around it can add a bit more value to that answer. There's a question from Mary Harford. The question was whether an ear bone, an ear pod can cause discomfort um the hardness of the airpods do f- not feel comfortable at all yeah i suspect if, if it's just not fitting your ear and the material itself it can co- uh, cause a bit of tenderness bruising against the cartilage especially if it doesn't fit your ears very well now my ear anatomy uh, doesn't very really lend well to having earplugs in at the entrance especially so if i wear plugs in my ears I've, and they're not custom made they do they're a bit uncomfortable but yeah, it's possible that it can cause a bit of tenderness to cartilage around your ear. Um, so um, typically over the ear headphones would be better in those cases. Uh, there's a lovely comment from Vicky who, through watching my videos and realised that I was doing talk overs. I think they've been watching for a while, but they didn't realise that uh, I was doing talk overs. Um, their mother had an ear infection, had antibiotics, and that they wanted to clean the ear out with pressurized water. But through the videos, they learned that that shouldn't be the case, and instead, they found an ENT who did suction. And so, yeah, you're welcome, and I hope your mother is feeling better. So, I think that's all the comments in the last two videos. Um, I hope you're all keeping well and safe and I shall speak to you all soon. Take care. Bye.